this, it's a hair clip. You're supposed to use it to hold your hair in place. Their primary use for me is as a fidget toy. It's quite satisfying to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And when I started playing with one of these things in ninth grade, uh, fidget toys weren't a thing. This is all I had. And after you play with it for a few hours, you start to realize they're pretty weird. At the end of the day, this thing's just a curved piece of metal. Well, here's another curved piece of metal, some tongs. And tongs, I can compress them. And then they go back to where they were. They go back to the same place every time. But these, the hair clip, after I compress it, it swaps. It goes to a different stable place. That's really weird. After I fidgeted with one of these things for enough hours, it broke on me. And when it broke, this is the shape that came out. And this shape, it turns out, answers all of my questions. Because this angle here, it's a right angle, 90 degrees. This angle here, by symmetry, also 90 degrees. This angle here, I don't know, maybe 10 degrees? That means 90, 180, 190 degrees? Triangles only have 180 degrees. But of course, triangles only have 180 degrees in a plane. You can have more than 180 degrees if you're on a different surface, like a sphere. Well, I have a sphere, I've cut it by three planes, right angle here, right angle here, right angle here, 270 degrees, and it fits just fine on a sphere. And of course, the final part of the equation is that because there's two spheres that these three angles could feasibly fit on there are two stable places. There's the sphere that fits on this side and the sphere that fits on this side. I was happy with that answer in ninth grade, but I'm a little bit more sophisticated now than I was then. I wanted to figure out a little bit more. What shape does this thing actually fit on? So I start off by taking a whole bunch of measurements. So first I measured up how high they were from a common reference point, which was in this shape case, just the flat ground. The tip here, the eyelet was two millimeters up. A random point in the front of the hair clip was four and a half millimeters above the ground and eight millimeters from the tip. The highest point I labeled as mid and six and a half millimeters up and it's 22 millimeters away from the tip. And the end point here, this is the end of where I'm measuring the hair clip, and it's four millimeters off the ground and 38 millimeters from the tip. This point has a width of five millimeters and the back has a width of 13 millimeters. I broke one intentionally to see if that changed in anything, if I could measure it being flattened. And with the back, I couldn't, it was only 13 millimeters. Arc length, that's this whole length here is a curved line as opposed to as a straight line, was noticeably longer. It was 39 millimeters as opposed to 38 millimeters. Not much of a difference, but it's one that uh, we'll exploit in a moment. I also did a whole bunch of angle measurements. I measured that the angle fr from the tip to the uh, back of the hair clip was nine degrees and in the other direction from the back of the hair clip in the direction of the tongue to the eyelet it was 24 degrees. And then for the broken hair clip, I measured the back corner was 90 degrees and I super glued the uh, top port part before I intentionally broke it. And I measured that that angle was 17 degrees. So the big idea of this is to model the hair clip as conforming to a circle, or I suppose a sphere of some form because we're in three dimensions. This is clearly not fully correct. Here I have a circle that I thought fit best with after a couple minutes of playing around with it. It overlaps the actual shape of the hair clip a bit on the far right hand side and near the back and near the tip but it doesn't quite go far enough out but it seemed like a pretty good estimate and also the one that's definitely easiest for me to use. Instead of modeling the shape of this curve with a circle I could have instead chose to use a catenary curve or a bunch of other choices. The reason why I didn't choose this option is because I know a whole lot more about circles than catenaries. And from this picture, it looks like circles will do a good enough job of estimating the shape of it for my purposes, which is to have fun and try out a whole bunch of different things. The first model I did uh, tried to find the circle which had a chord length and an arc length uh, from the two points. So the chord length is from the eyelet directly to the back where the tongue meets and the arc length is along the curve here. So this would be the arc length and this here is the chord length and you can use some trigonometry to come up with some equations. Uh, use theta and radians because then you get this nice equation without any pi's and after you put them together, you get this equation here. So the chord length divided by the arc length is equal to the sine of the angle divided by two all divided by the angle divided by two. Uh, this function here goes by another name, it'd be sinc, S-I-N-C of theta over two. I had heard it was important and uh, now I understand why. It's a 
good wavelength correlates and arc lengths together. If you plug in to your favorite solver and get an answer out of this, you get the theta is 0.79 radians or 45 degrees and a radius of 49 millimeters. The second model I did was to fit three points into the circle. To do this, I took the measurements I took and plotted them to the GeoGebra. So the tip here is point A, it's two millimeters up and zero millimeters over. The B point here is the front point. It is four and a half millimeters up and eight millimeters over. The mid one is point C and the end is point D. Between any three points, you can figure out the circle that goes between them. The trick is to use the perpendicular bisector. Perpendicular bisector contains all the points that are equidistant from two points. So if we do that for A and B, and you get line F. If you do that for B and C, you get line G. That means that all the points that lie on line F are equidistant to A and B. All of the points that lie on line G are equidistant to point B and C. So you put them together and their intersection point, which I happen to know is E, though it's not clear to see that from here. That point, which is equidistant to A and B, because it lines, lies on line F, and it's also equidistant to points B and C because it lines on line G, which means that A, B, and C are all equidistant from point E, which means that is the center of a circle. Whatever the radius is, that circle will go through points A, B, and C. So I did that for all combinations of these four points. You get these four different centers, F, G, H, and E. The largest diameter is point E, which goes through points A, B, and C, and it's 70 millimeters. And the smallest diameter is a circle that goes through B, C, D. That's point F, and it has a radius of 51 millimeters. This brings us to our third model, which is an angle and two points. It's very similar to the three points, except of course we only have two points. The way we, in some sense, recover the information for this third point is if we can assume that this angle is tangent to the circle, and we can take the perpendicular line to it at the point where it should be tangent, and that line has to go through the center of the circle, and the perpendicular bisector, as we discussed before, also has to go through the center of the circle. So their intersection gives us a point, and uh, we have two angles which we can do this with. We have the angle from the tip here is nine degrees, and if we plug that in, we get 121 millimeter radius, and the angle from the back is 24 degrees, and if we plug that in, we get 46 millimeter radius, and we're still using a length of 38 millimeters from before. All three of these models so far only dealt with the curve in this long direction, but we can instead go with the curve in both directions. We can model it as a sphere. We have these eight points because we measured where four of them were on one side carefully, and we measure their width so we can uh, do a linear interpolation of where these points in the middle, where they lie on the left and right direction. And with these eight points, any four of them that are non-planar, such that also non-three of them are non-collinear, will form a unique sphere. And you can figure out that there are in fact a total of 31 spheres that you'd expect from that. I did not plot 31 spheres to determine all their radiuses. I only plotted four. If you plot four points, you can do the same thing you did with the circle with perpendicular bisectors. You just have to be careful that perpendicular bisectors between two points are not lines, but they are in fact planes, and then three sets of them to create three planes that all intersect at a point. So I did that for four of the spheres. I separated them with a pipe to denote that they were which ones I chose on the same side of each other. And of course, they're symmetric, whether I chose both left or both rights. When I calculated the various radiuses, I got that they range between 71 millimeters at the front end. If I chose all four that are the back, like this picture, I had that they were 52 millimeters. This model shows that you start off with a rather small radius at the back of the hair clip, and as you move towards the tip of the hair clip, you get a larger radius. There's another option for our model, and that is we can think about how they're intended to be used. You'd expect that it would fit pretty well onto your head, and it does, actually. You can just kind of feel it. It's easy to measure it with just a tape measure. The radius of my head is about 55 millimeters. Another option we have is we can figure out how these things would actually attach. So here are two hair clips. We can line them up carefully so that the edge, the line forms the same. It's distinct from the edges being tangent at the point they meet. That is a somewhat less of an angle than if we make the actual curves coincide. If we make the actual curves coincide, we get this thing here, what I did was I hot glued them all together. I went down to my local 3D print shop and I printed out this thing. This thing is 25 millimeters in the short direction and 60 millimeters in the long direction. The way I did this is I took a sphere and I just extended it in one direction. And if we put the hot glue gunned hair clip monstrosity onto it, it fits very well. It spins with much less friction than you'd expect. That gives us in some sense an empirical evaluation of it. But of course, it's not perfect either. It doesn't quite fit. You can see all the space between the hair clip and the shape. I wanted to include a model that used the Gauss-Binet theorem, but computing these integrals presented a lot of practical problems for how to do it in real life. So that didn't happen. So here are all of the results of the models collated into one nice table. The smallest measurement we had was 
25 millimeters, but this is an outlier. Only the model where we actually constructed the shape in real life was the one that took into account its radius in the short direction. All the other models took into account its width in the long direction. If we look at just the radiuses measured of the circles in the long direction, the smallest radius that we measured was 46 millimeters, and the largest radius we measured was 121 millimeters. It's a little funny that these both came from the same model where we fit two points and an angle to a circle. And the reason why this one has such extremes is that this 46 millimeters is very indicative of the radius of the hair clip at the base of it. And this 121 is indicative of the radius at the tip of it. So seems like the problem's all sorted out, except it's not. There is a paper that I was written called In Plain Pre-Stressed Hair Clip Mechanism for the Fastest Untethered Compliant Fish Robot. And I assume it's a good paper. I don't understand it. Um, but it used small deflection theory and Euler beam theory and buckling theory. And overall, it came up that the shape is approximately that of a Bessel curve. Uh, it used a system of second order differential equations, three equations uh, to solve this. And uh, maybe that's what I'm going to spend the next couple of months learning about. We'll see. Thank you for listening to my talk and satisfying my curiosity about what shape a hair clip actually is. Um, it is reminding me how good of a fidget toy these things are. I highly recommend you go out and get some. And I'd like to give my thanks to my ninth grade geometry teacher who taught me so well that I remembered all this. I could just do it off the fly when I wanted to for this YouTube video. And Summer of Math Exposition 3 for actually encouraging me to make this video. So thank you.